I want to say hi to everyone and welcome to the Tennessee Native Plant Society's monthly Native Plant Seminar. And before we get started, I have a couple quick things to run past to share. Um, one, I know it's the weather has been atrocious and I'm glad everybody could make it. The lovely thing about doing it via Zoom is that the weather can be frightful and uh, we won't. Um, I'm sorry. I forgot to mute my phone. Okay. Um, sorry about that. I apologize. And no Karen, way, maybe I'm good about Karen, it. Karen, maybe remind everybody to mute themselves too. That's a good idea. Everybody should mute themselves at this point. And uh, except for Mary, <laughs> please don't mute yourself, Mary. And, <clears throat> there you are. Okay. I want to. Make you a co-host. All right. Um, a couple of short announcements. One is I have a message from Rita Venable, um, who's a member of TNPS. She's been on the, she's participated in a lot of ways in TNPS. Uh, she's hosting a few segments of Volunteer Gardener on NPT. She's done it a few times before. Uh, but she has a few more segments that she's doing in 2024. And she's looking for good native gardens to feature on the show. And she's open to suggestions. She's asking if uh, you, any of you listeners, have a beautiful garden that you want to show off or know of someone who does, please contact Rita at ritavenable.com. It's just Rita at Rita Venable, one, one word, dot com. And if you forget her, you can just contact, just, just access me through info at tnps.org and I'll pass your message along. Okay. So, <clears throat> and I want to let you know that we have almost a full slate of seminars coming up, coming up for this year. Um, the next, next month in February on the 20th, we have John Mannion talking about native ferns. On March 19th, we have Steve Murphy from Belmont University talking about the return of the cicadas, which if you haven't been read up on it yet. There's a major emergence occurring this year in Middle Tennessee. Um, and then in April, we have Symbiotic Schoolyard with Jenica Peterson, who wrote this. It's a new curriculum for middle school students that is entirely on native lands. So that should be really good. And if you know of any teachers who might be interested, please give them a heads up and make sure they're invited to attend that one. <clears throat> and now, without further ado, uh, I'm going to welcome tonight's speaker, Mary Priestley, who's well known. She's past president of TNPS. She's still very active in teaching classes. Botany 101 in the uh, uh, Native Plant Certificate Pro Certificate in Native Plants program down in uh, Chattanooga. And she's going to be talking tonight on evolution of flowering plants. This is going to be a, a shortened version of the class that she offers for um, the certificate but it should be really good. I've already gone through the slides. Fabulous. She's going to keep us 
<laughs> she's she's really going to pour a lot of knowledge into our heads in a short time. <laughs> um, Mary is a Swanee Herbarium Associate. She's editor and illustrator of the Friends of the Herbarium newsletter. She's quite an artist. She did note cards for TNPS way back in the early days. Uh, she's author of several books, Swanee Wildflowers in Color, Williams Wildflowers, which is a children's guide. What if trees could walk? It's a Swanee tree book. And Fiery Gizzard, Voices from the Wilderness. So um, she assisted in writing and editing our TNPS field guide, Wildflowers of Tennessee, the Ohio Valley, and the Southern Appalachians. She's also edited Under the Sun at Swanee, the third edition. She's been nature journaling for 15 years and conducted several nature journaling workshops, one for us on the seminars in the seminar series a couple of years ago. So um, without further ado, I'm gonna say, uh, Mary, I have put you in as a co-host and whenever you're ready, I'll bring up the, um, we're gonna, Mary's had some computer issues. So I'm presenting the slides and Mary's doing the talking. So I'm not sure how this is gonna work. It may mean that our video bounces back and forth. I hope not, but we're going to try and get this, work our way through this and see if I can bring up the slides now. Thank you, Karen. Okay. Um, can everybody see the slides? No. You can't. Okay. All right. Not on one. Okay. Try this. I'm also on a new computer. So bear with me. I am trying to figure out how and why things are in different places on you this You could probably take me, take me off as a co-host, co if that makes any difference. No, I don't think it does. I think I have to share your screen. That's where it is, okay. I haven't done that yet. Whoops. It's coming. Can you Can you see it now? There we go. Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, okay, great. Do you want to put it in the presentation view or just leave it like that? Just like that is just totally fine with me. Works just fine. Um, well, I had it right set for present. It's in presenter view. Oh, okay. Well, the presenter. Okay. Well, whatever. Doesn't matter. Um, so this is a... Um, as as Karen said, a shortened uh, form of a program that I did for um, the wild ones. And um, Karen said, well, I've, I've looked at it. It's all 55 slides. I want you to know, Karen, it's 45 slides. And not only that, but this group that we're with tonight is not just the average group. And we can easily get through 45 slides with this above average group so I'm not the least bit scared well I sort of was I started thinking you know this could be potentially intimidating so I decided what might be kind of interesting um oh that is interesting oh Karen I wonder if you got the original no joke um yeah I think that, it is the original I didn't see where anything okay. had been edited all right well we'll just go with it um so anyway what I decided that would do is to um is to show you this 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 um, show and then talk to you and t tell you kind of how I taught it because I mean with some of these people that are um, on this um, I feel really silly telling them the difference between a monocot and a dicot so I will just 
um, I'll tell you what I did and why I did it. Um, so starting off with a quotation from Augustine Gattinger, who, of course, was our first state botanist in 1901. Um, and so, Karen, if you could move it forward, I'm just going to show um, really what I leaned out on. It was a plant systematics textbook. There's a great, if you like to draw, there's this wonderful book called The Science Behind Flowers, Plant Morphology for Botanical Artists which um, I used um, pretty extensively. And then I thought if you would like to um, learn more about this on your own, I think the word, uh, the book Botany in a Day is really um, an awfully good one. Uh, okay. If you just want to say next. Next. Okay. Either one. Um, so here's what we did. And um, we basically um, went kind of back and forth from uh, the general to the specific, um, did a lot of dissection um, uh, theory to, to actual examples, um, kind of back and forth, did a lot of dissections. We um, even got to fruits, which we will uh, probably not get to today. Next. Um, started with Ostromeria, which I think is a is a great little plant. Um, it's just a uh, inexpensive grocery store flower, uh, and it's big. Um, it's a big monocot, pretty big monocot. And um, uh, one cool thing about it is that it has resupinate leaves. You know how um, orchids have a lot of orchids have resupinate flowers. That is, they're flipped upside down. The same is true of Ostromeria as far as its leaves are concerned. That's why they always look so kind of disheveled. Um, but anyway, I handed those out and um, got everybody to, to look at them, try to use their, their hand lens if they could to uh, count all the structures and then to make a horizontal cut across the bottom of the pistol and see if they could see that it was in, uh, in sections and see if they could see immature seeds in there, which I think just about everybody did. Next. Then we talked about flowers and what flowers are, the origin of flowers. Um, now this is um, largely, Kim or somebody could really probably add a, a lot to this, but I think this is, this is just basically the best guess. There um, is, as far as I know, no direct evidence of this. But a flower is considered a branch, a very special branch. Branches um, or twigs, branches occur in the buds of leaves. That's one way you tell a leaf from a leaflet is whether or not there's a bud at the axle. And if you can imagine um, a twig with um, a bunch of leaves on it, and then over time, the internodes, the spaces between the nodes, start to shrink. Then, next, you think about um, also, you've got to deal with um, both female and male structure. So uh, female structure, if, if it starts out as a leaf, um, you could really almost imagine that it looks like the scale of a, of a pine cone, really. That first, that second drawing, first one right past the female symbol. Um, a couple of uh, potential ovules out on a leaf. Then as evolution proceeds, this is you know within the population, not within the organism. Within the population, the, the edges of these leaves might curve in somewhat, curve in some more, and you get the development of sticky hairs or something that might indeed collect pollen, a little more closing in, and then um, finally arrive at a structure that is recognizable today as a pistil. All the way closed up ovary at the bottom, some kind of a tube, and then those sticky parts up at the very top. For males, you don't really have a reduction of the um, gametophytes or, um, uh, well, in this case, it's pollen. You have all this potential um, pollen sitting out on a leaf. And then over time, the leaf curves and curves and, um, and there is development. And then you get a, a stamen, which has got zillions of little pollen granules 
inside it. Um, again, this is really somebody using their imagination. And I think this is just the best story that people have come up with so far. Next. Ta-da! Then you end up magic <laughs> with a flower. <laughs> and of course, um, you know, goodness knows. Uh, but as I say, it's the best we've come up with so far. I then went over a few um, terms, which I'm sure you all are familiar with, um, basically all of them. Um, angiosperm means housed seed. Uh, gynesium is the female part. Um, the term is uh, related to gynecology. Andresium is the stamens, the male part. On the very outside is the calyx and then the corolla. Uh, calyx and corolla together because they're not really the business part of the flower are called together the perianth. It's interesting to have these terms complete and incomplete, perfect and imperfect when it comes to flowers. Um, a complete, complete flower has all four of those different structures, all those whorls. An incomplete flower lacks at least one, um, but a perfect flower has both the male and the female structures. Uh, so a plant can actually be perfect and incomplete at the same time. Kind of like us, I guess, in some ways. Um, and then an imperfect flower lacks stamens or pistils. And these, all these are all over the place all the time. Um, then you get the two terms, monoecious and dioecious, which refer to plants that have imperfect flowers. A monoecious plant, example would be a begonia or maybe an oak tree or a hickory tree, is a species with um, imperfect flowers, but each plant has both male and female flowers. And then a dioecious plant like holly is one in which they're imperfect flowers and they appear on different plants. Next. So here we back. This is oh, and I these draw these are drawings from my nature journal basically that I pulled in. Um, but uh, this is the Alstroemeria, and so we looked at it and we started to put together a floral formula for this flower. Every every flower has a floral formula, which consists of numbers for the calyx, corolla, numbers, stamens, and the number of pistils. So for Alstroemeria, um, you, there are three sepals and three petals. So K and C each are three. However, they look so much alike that, I, that we generally call uh, those structures tepals. So the, the plant actually has six tepals, three uh, sepals, three petals. Um, it's got six stamens and they're nice and big and easy to see. And then one pistil, which is compound, you cut it open and you can see that it's three, cut three uh, sections. So the floral formula for Alstroemeria would be three, three, six, one. Okay. Then um, we looked at, at uh, symmetry and um, ovary position. Um, uh, at tenomorphic or radial flower with radial symmetry, you can cut with um, in, in, in multiple lines and you can still get halves, whereas a zygomorphic or bilateral flower can be cut in half along only one plane. Um, there are different, different positions of the ovary relative to the um, other structures in the flower. And um, so students were asked to describe the symmetry and ovary position. And um, Alstroemeria is actually um, bilaterally symmetrical. It's got a definite top and bottom. And um, the ovary is inferior. Okay. Then we step back to um, what's called a, really a, a basal dicot yellow poplar, one of uh, a plant that shows a lot of ancestral characteristics for, um, for a flowering plant. And this was really 
Charlotte Freeman, the person, I don't know if any of you Chad Niggins know her, but she's a really gung-ho. She collected all these yellow poplar flowers for me, froze them, and then dragged them back out last fall. And um, they were just barely, barely um, good enough to, to see the structures. But we did look at it pretty closely. And um, we found that it's got three sepals, six petals, multiple stamens, and multiple separate pistils. Um, it is a radially symmetrical flower, and the, the ovaries are have superior position. These are a lot of these are characteristics of um, more ancestral um, flowers, and so this was a good one. This would be a good starting starting point. I think. Okay, next. Um, then we looked at, at the, the basic differences between monocots and dicots. Um, most of these structures are really morphological. Uh, monocots, for instance, um, uh, well, I guess uh, cotyledon is a little harder to see sometimes, but definitely flower parts in threes. Um, leaf veins parallel, and then uh, diffuse root structure are pretty easy to pick out um, with most monocots. Um, if you do a cross section of the stem, you can see how the vascular bundles are arranged. Um, they're just kind of scattered throughout the stem. In contrast to that, uh, dicots, as their name implies, have two cotyledons per seed. Uh, flower parts are in fours or fives. The veins um, of the leaf are netted. They often have a tap root, and the vascular bundles are in a ring in the stem um, with a vascular cambium. This allows for uh, secondary secondary growth uh, or wood. Um, there aren't any true woody monocots. I mean, there's some. Well, I mean, there are palm trees and there's bamboo. And what? Smilax is somewhat kind of semi-woody, but um, there are no woody um, monocots uh, in the sense that, that we're describing them here. Okay. Oh, okay. So this, um, that previous slide, um, Karen, I, that was a reminder to me that if there are any questions, um, that would be, um, you know, you could put them in the chat and maybe you could... Uh, pull them out at, at times like this. There are, I think, two or three, these little interrupting slides, um, if you like. Uh, but let's move on to number the next slide. Um, so we had, I got at the um, um, nursery, some little little jumping jacks, uh, Johnny jump ups, excuse me. <laughs> and uh, we looked at those. Um, and I tried to get people to do drawings and um, because I think really, you know, any kind of hand eye stuff um, is very helpful for learning. Um, and um, so they, they drew it, they looked in the flowers, um, they decided this was a dicot. Um, it, was a, it was perfect and complete, it has everything. Um, all, the, all the structures, both male and female structures, um, it is bilaterally symmetrical. You can only cut it in half one way. Um, and the ovary is superior. Um, floral formula, five, 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 one. So we just kind of went through that um, with that flower. Took a little more time than we're taking here. Um, next. Now, cool one that, that we looked at, and this is uh, so, I was doing this for the wild ones and occasionally, and I know some of you all are probably members of that group, they will say, oh, you know, we have to do natives. We have to do natives. And I will say, well, guess what? I'm not going to, to dig a lot of natives up to show you this stuff. So I would go to the grocery store and so forth. And a uh, spathophyllum or spathophyllum is a, a very common um, house plant that is closely related to our um, uh, Jack in the Pulpit and um, has a hood-like spathe in underneath which or inside which is a, a spadex 
with much reduced incomplete flowers, male and female flowers. Uh, when you do a floral formula, um, you do a, a separate one for the male flowers than for the female flowers. Interestingly, in the spathophyllum, the um, male and female flowers were interspersed among each other. They were, they were not grouped separately the way they are in our erysema, our native plant. So that was kind of see, interesting to see uh, the difference in arrangement. But basically their plan is the same um, with all these uh, really minuscule uh, incomplete flowers gathered together on the spadix. Next. Talked a little bit about the history of classification. Um, Susan Stahl gave me this great book. This, um, it's, it, the title is something like Wildflowers of, of America by this Mr. F.S. Matthews in 1912. And if you look closely, it turns out that he did um, a good deal of work in um, well, some in New England and all the way down to Virginia didn't get over to um, the Midwest or certainly not past the Mississippi or past the Ohio River. But anyway, he put out in 1912, this book called um, Wildflowers of America. And he's a hoot, I mean, in more than one way. And then look what he says in 1912, and boy, can we relate to this. Regarding that bugbear of the botanical student nomenclature, it may well, it may be well to make a plain statement of the facts of the case. What is particularly hard to do is the fact that the botanists have apparently shaken the names up in a bag and sorted them out afresh. So if you have had, if you have tried, as I have tried, to learn these names of these plants and figure out what family they're in and, and try to get them all straight, it, it, um, it's really pretty frustrating. It was for this Mr. Matthews and and it is for us today. It's a it's a complicated thing. But um, anyway, we talked a little bit about how Linnaeus came up with this idea of binomial nomenclature. And he had this idea of grouping plants in what he called natural families. But he had no idea of evolution. He assumed that uh, these all living things were created, you know, the same week or whatever. I'm not sure his... Um, philosophy, but anyway, he didn't see any evidence of change. Darwin, on the other hand, in the, the mid 19th century, um, came up with this idea of uh, evolution by natural selection and um, the idea of common ancestry between groups. So we, we began to uh, um, consider nested groupings of plants. Um, which suggested common ancestry. And we used morphological characters, that is um, uh, what, we could, what we could see in the, in the plant's um, uh, exterior anatomy and, uh, and, and anatomy. Um, then along came molecular data, which is what kind of turned everything on its uh, ear. And now we use a phylogenetic approach called cladistics which insists on, um, on um, identifying only groups that have one, one uh, single ancestor and so forth. And it, I think it's really very helpful. If you think about the entire living world, um, uh, I used to teach the five kingdoms, five kingdom system where you had Monerans, that was the bacteria and all archaebacteria, um, the protista, which were um, single-celled organisms, but it was a it was a grab bag. You had some protists that looked like that seemed like plants, some like animals, and some like fungi. They were all single cells, so they threw them all in together, which is completely opposed. The phylogenetic approach completely opposes that, and um, I think it's well that that currently um, Algae, for instance, is now considered part of the plant kingdom, which it didn't used to be. Uh, okay. Um, so then I did a, a couple of definitions. Uh, plant systematics is the science of biodiversity and the relationships between organisms. 
The aim is to discover all the branches of the evolutionary tree of life and communicate this to others in a clear classification system. And I think almost the key word there is aim because it is still really very difficult. There are um, organisms that are classified um, in in two um, kingdoms, for instance, and will have different names in the two kingdoms. And so it depends upon who you're talking to as to what, um, what you're talking about. And then uh, evolutionary trees, which we have been trying to put together, a best guess about the history of a group of plants. Um, and then today, if you look at the bottom of this, uh, this slide, we use morphological data, which we've been using, molecular data, developmental information, that is how the plant is developing and what develops in the same way, and then evidence from the fossil record. So all those um, are used together to try to put together the ancestry and um, of plants. Next. And here is the most rudimentary of um, evolutionary trees. Um, some members of the, of the rose family. Um, it's obvious, I think, just by looking at them, that blackberries and raspberries have a common ancestor, which, and then, and then uh, cherries also have a common, common ancestor with those two, but the two types of berries there are more closely related to each other than they are to the, to the cherry. So um, this, is the kind, this is the way uh, the phylogenetic approach or cladistics um, goes about reasoning out um, these groupings, okay? Um, then we looked back um, beyond flowering plants to um, the other groups of tracheophytes. Um, it's interesting to note that ferns and fern allies are considered two separate groups. They both reproduce using spores, but they have different um, evolutionary bases. Um, then of course the gymnosperms, which is basically largely our conifers, and the angiosperms, which are our flowering plants. Um, so this is um, kind of the development of the, um, of the plant kingdom, okay? We then started looking at, at uh, individuals, and I won't spend very much time on this, but here's a fern ally, Selaginella, and a fern, hay-scented fern. We talked about um, true root stems and leaves and the fact that these reproduce using spores. The propagule, uh, reproductive propagule is um, a spore in both of those cases, okay? One thing that um, that I think is really cool, and I really try to um, get across to um, to students, is this idea of alternation of generations, which is a characteristic of all plants. Um, basically, in a fern, it's it's so cool in that the two generations that alternate are actually both free living, so you can see the two generations uh, independent of each other. On the left is what we think of as a fern plant, which is called the sporophyte. It's diploid like we are. That is, it has two copies of every single one of the different kinds of chromosomes in that species. Um, and then um, by meiosis, spores are produced, which are haploid. Um, and that's up at the top. Um, the, hep, the little teeny weeny spores are being released and right there. Yeah. Um, and then the spores, the spore. land, excuse me. Oh, that's me. <laughs> and then the spores um, land, germinate and grow up into a, a little thallus or a little, the little gametophyte. There it is. The gametophyte then by um, regular row mitosis produces eggs and sperm which on a rainy day in February um, may find each other, um, merge, form a zygote, and then from the little gametophyte up grows a little tiny sporophyte. And you can see that little bitty leaf at the top of um, what Karen's pointing out to us, um, where the sporophyte is now growing more or less out of the gametophyte. So this is um, something that, that um, 
that we push because it's really it's really cool, I think, and unusual and unique and um, a very different thing from the way humans and other animals are um, the way their life cycle goes. OK. Um, so then again, we proceeded on beyond ferns and fern allies into the development of seed plants, plants that have seeds as their propagule. And um, the difference between a spore, which is a haploid cell, single cell, and um, a seed, which is a little multicellular baby plant with food in it in a protective seed coat. Um, and then some of the some of the uh, developments that had to go along in order for this to have happened. Um, heterospory, that is different microspores and megaspores had to be developed. Um, I, um, it turns out that the selaginella actually has heterospory, which was a surprise to me when I was going over this. Um, the development of wood. And then um, we talked a little bit about um, uh, development of flowers and the development of seeds, of course, goes along with that. Um, the um, heterospory, again, uh, the decrease in number of megaspores. Um, you want to have fewer eggs and more sperm. Um, the, um, the integument surrounding the, the female gamete um, with, uh, with a little opening and, and the development then from after all of that of um, gymnosperms, um, of which there are four groups and really, you know, the conifers are the only, uh, I think the only native group around here. Uh, we certainly have got ginkgos, we've got cycads around um, uh, in nurseries. Um, neophytes, which are pretty cool, we see in um, interesting um, uh, botanical gardens, but I think that's about it. Okay. Um, Okay, so then finally, and I think everybody was just, um, you know, breathing a sigh of relief when we finally got to angiosperms. Um, and here, the, um, what we see is seeds that are enclosed in a carpal, which um, then develops into a fruit. Um, the female gametophyte, which in um, ferns you could actually see, it's about the size of your... Um, little fingernail, um, it's now reduced down to only eight nuclei. There is um, a phenomenon called double fertilization, which is unique to the angiosperms. And then also they have a more efficient vascular system than you see in the gymnosperms. Okay. And this is the slide that I love the most. So um, all of a sudden, angiosperm, well, of course, all right, now wait. So John Muir said that everything is hitched together. So you can't just look at development in terms of one type of phenomenon or organism. However, if you want to look at it from the point of view of, of angiosperms, angiosperms changed the planet with the development of this huge variety of flowering plants, you get a huge diversification of pollinators, insects and birds and others that pollinate these flowers, and a huge diversification of seed dispersers. Again, organisms that disperse seeds. Um, herbivores, all these invertebrates and vertebrates that eat plants then developed um, uh, huge um, diversity. And the microorganisms com comprising the plant microbiome, all those little bacteria and fungi and all those guys that, that interact with this huge variety of plants. Um, Biogeochemical cycles were affected by the development of angiosperms, the, you know, the water cycle and the carbon cycle and so forth. Agriculture would not have developed had it not been for the develop for the rise of 
flowering plants. There would not have been anything to farm. And with the rise of agriculture, you get the rise of human civilization. So you see it all, it all comes down to yellow poplar, which was the very first angiosperm just about, um, changed the whole planet. I love that thought. I love that thought. Okay. Um, next. So Karen, do we have any, anybody saying anything or they're just speechless with, um, <laughs> well, <clears throat> sorry. Um, that's okay. I, We're good. Because I'm fun working this, this slides, I, I can't see this I, chat very easily. See, this is you are you are working double time here. I really appreciate it. Okay, yeah, well, I don't think they're, they're used to waiting till the end. Questions. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. Good. Well, let's move on then. Um, and let's see. Okay, so then we look at three groups of, of angiosperms, and, and a lot of times, um, you know, until you get into a plant systematics course, you really think in terms of, of only uh, two groups of angiosperms, the monocots and the dicots. But actually, the basal dicots, the most uh, ancestral dicots, including the yellow poplar that I've got there, um, um, are one group, and out of that group, monocots evolved, as did the U dicots, or the more, um, I don't want to use the word advanced, the more derived um, uh, dicots. Um, monocots are a much smaller species with a couple of great big families in it. And uh, U dicots is a, is a big group. On sat on um, the other day, Saturday, when I was teaching this botany one, virtually everybody in the class had the Native Plant Society uh, manual. And I said, let's turn and We've lost your voice, Mary. If you can hear me, Mary, we've lost sound for you. She's also lost her visual, too, I think. Oh, she got bumped off, I guess. Let's give her a chance to come back on. Sorry about that. Sorry we about lost that. Lost you for a bit. Yeah, that was scary. But um, I'm back. So anyway, um, these are these three groups. And um, let's see, you've probably gotten plenty of time to look at that slide. Um, let's look at the next one. Um, so uh, big picture again, looking at uh, the trend in evolution of plants, um, how we got to angiosperms from algae, little single-celled aquatic organisms up to uh, terrestrial plants, beginning with some kind of relative of bryophytes, uh, ferns and fern allies, gymnosperms and angiosperms that had this double fertilization and um, flowers and fruits that attract pollinators and seed dispersers. And then more development of angiosperms um, going from simple to compound pistils. If you can, if you can picture um, the yellow poplar with all those simple pistils all clustered together in the center of that flower, um, this uh, larkspur over here um, is, uh, uh, is a ranunculaceae and it is got um, fairly um, ancestral flowers too. It's got three simple pistils that are separate, which is pretty cool. Um, other members of the of the ranunculaceae do that same thing, and that is a considered an ancestral trait. 
um, when parts start to fuse, um, then you you get more um, development, and then moving from superior to inferior ovary. Um, supposedly, the placement of the ovary beneath the attachment point of the petals and sepals um, is in, is a, a development advancement. Okay, next. Oh boy, yeah. Let's skip this. This these are I definitely skip that. Um, impatience, I, just, I couldn't talk about that. And let's skip the next one. Um, oh, this was a really pretty cool thing. This is These are some photos that um, Charlotte Freeman gave me. So we looked at, at this just through the, through the photos. We counted the calyx lobes and the corolla and the, the stamens and so forth and, and looked at the differences. She had, she had uh, taken her flowers apart to show all this stuff. So uh, we um, we looked at it, and let's look at the next one. Next, oh okay. So here's a uh, the first mint. Uh, this I guess is the only mint that we looked at. Um, obedient plant. Another great quote from this fellow who wrote this book that Susan gave me. When one reaches the mints, whatever trouble existed before seems like child's play. Here is an order of plants which was apparently created for the express purpose of convincing the amateur that he can never master botany. So there. <laughs> so we looked at that and um, it's really tough, you know, when you're just looking at pictures, but anyway, that was what we did. And again, she, she dissected these, so it was fun to look at them. Uh, next. And here's a good shot, same plant. Um, and um, it has five calyx lobes, which you can't really see there. Um, a two-lipped corolla, um, four stamens, a, um, exerted stigma that is uh, two-parted, superior ovary, and then fruit is um, four mericarps. Um, okay, so we were just looking, just just looking at another flower, which is basically what we did um, all morning there. Okay, next. This is another one of these cool diagrams. Um, this shows um, development of um, the uh, reproductive structures in a lily, which is um, just a classic uh, organism that people look at for this. Um, on, on the outside um, circle or cycle, uh, you see the development of the, um, the ovule, the female um, gametophyte. And as a matter of fact, at the end of those arrows, and of course this occurs inside the ovary, at the ends of the air, end of those, there you go, you get to this little structure called the female gametophyte, which is composed of merely eight cells, well, eight well, nuclei, eight. with some, some membranes um, dividing those. That's much, much reduced gametophyte from say looking at a uh, moss where the whole plant is basically the gametophyte. Then on the inside thing, right there you go, starting right there is the development of the pollen grains. This is sort of a cross section of a stamen and then on through there, um, some um, meiosis. And then the next little one right there is a pollen grain that's got two nuclei on the inside of it. So that right there is the mature male gametophyte um, down to this two-celled or two-nucleate um, structure. It lands on the stigma then, and one of those nuclei is called a tube nucleus, and it bores a tube all the way down, down from the stigma, down through the style, down into the ovary, the other nucleus, which is the generative nucleus, splits in two, and each of those is a sperm. One of the sperm then um, unites with the egg nucleus, which is one of those eight up there in the female gametophyte, and um, the other one it joins up with two other nuclei, the polar nuclei, to produce what's called endosperm, which is a, a nutritious um, tissue. Um, the double fertilization then is uh, unique to, to angiosperms. Um, and this, this occurs, it's, it's nice in lily because lilies, 
uh, they actually have slides of these that we used to be able to use because um, they don't have too many chromosomes and it's pretty easy to see all this stuff. Next. Uh, then we looked at a rose and um, determined that it was a dicot. Um, we wanted to see that uh, that hypanthium, which is a, um, produces a rose hip, which um, is um, an interesting uh, structure in the rose in some of the members of the rose family. Um, the flower was uh, perfect, symmetrical. Ovaries were um, superior, and you could do a floral formula of five, five multiple, multiple for this one. For multiple, you do a little, one of those little um, uh, infinity symbols. Okay. Then went back over again, um, the, the three uh, positions, which um, you can find in different groups of the rose family. Um, the ovary can either be superior, inferior, or half, half inferior. And so um, it's kind of fun to look at that, think about um, those different groupings of the rose family. Next. So at this point, we're making a mad dash through some of the major families. Um, this is um, two types of uh, lady slippers and uh, uh, platanthera that um, uh, three different types of orchids and uh, talked a little bit about some of the unique characteristics of orchids. Um, and um, one of them, I guess a big thing is the fact, well, it's not unique, but it's unusual um, that the pollen is actually not individual pollen grains, but um, is captured in these little clumps called pollinia. I learned too that the platanthera um, is, is um, anatomically arranged so that when butterflies come to nectar on it, it actually sticks the pollinium on the butterfly's eyeball of all things. So they have pictures on the internet of these butterflies with these little pollinia uh, sticking, to their, sticking to their eyes, which I think is kind of interesting. Okay, next. Uh, Heath family, um, it's, um, uh, certainly, we've got plenty of those here and, and up in the mountains with our acidic um, acidic soils. Um, I, I can't remember really what I said about them, except for the fact that um, it's a diverse group of, of uh, woody plants. Um, and of course, each one is just gorgeous. Next. Ah, the composites. Um, so this is fun to get to. This is always fun. Um, and I remember my mentor, George Ramser, saying each each flower is actually a bouquet of flowers. And I, I've repeated that many, many times myself. Um, it's just a it's a really fun family with a interesting formulaic um, uh, structure. Um, can you uh, ne next, please? Uh, so this is some of Charlotte's pictures again. She had a lot more pictures um, uh, to share, and I, I put them on there. Next. And here's the structure, more or less kind of a di slightly diagrammatic look at um, the um, flower, the two types of florets, actually, or flowers that um, you can find within the family. You can find either one or the other or both, and one or the other could be um, fertile, um, the other sterile or whatever. Um, uh, I mentioned the, to look for chaff, little scales that are in amongst the disc flowers and, um, and the, the involucre that surrounds the whole thing. So just, um, just sort of, a, this was just um, to let people know that it was maybe a little more complicated than it, than it looks. Um, at face value. Next. Oh, so then I showed this page. This is a page out of my nature journal where I could not, I was having a really a hard time with this coreopsis. And um, I think I'm right about the ID, but 
anyway, it was kind of fun to uh, share with them the, the conundrum that you that I have anyway, a lot of times trying to identify some of these plants. Uh, next. Then we looked at a, a black eyed Susan, and this was another example, another um, plant that that Charlotte had taken pictures of. And so I used um, used her pictures uh, to talk about um, this this particular genus and um, its structures. Um, and, you know, the it's got both ray and disc flowers. The rays are yellowy, orangey. There is chaff in the in the uh, disc. The disc flowers are fertile. Um, the bracts all around are all similar. The receptacle kind of is uh, bulges up in the center. Um, there's virtually no pappus, and um, the ray flowers are not accompanied by bracts. I'm not sure about that part. I can't remember that. But anyway, so those are characteristics of the Rudbeckia. Next. And. This is some more. I've forgotten. I guess we must have looked at this one um, and dissected it. Okay, next. Now, this is really just continues the romp through. I, I wanted uh, people to know that some of the members of the bean family have a, a really characteristic um, inflorescence. Um, five petals, um, well, two of them are fused. Uh, one forms a standard up top. Um, two wings and then a keel, which is formed from two more. Um, that's um, characteristic of a number of members of this of this family. Next, so I had almost nothing in my nature journal about um, members of the parsley family, uh, carrot family, whichever Queen Anne's lace and its its relatives. So um, uh, this was just a, a quick mention of that family um, using this uh, tenidia. Next. Oh, and I don't know even why I put that in there. So this was gone. This, <laughs> this was, oh, I know what it was. So this, okay. The, um, I got some flowers out of the um, greenhouse yeah, here at yeah. Swanee. And um, he had this blooming ginger. And he said, now I know those wild ones, they're not going to want to look at anything that's not native. And I said, well, I don't care. I'm, I'm taking it. And so um, I took it over because I do think that, that people, including the wild ones, are interested in the diversity. And so I had a, um, an, an inflorescence there to show them. And I just stuck this... Um, stuck this little rhizome in, in there to the picture to remind myself that that was what we were going to talk about. So we did that. Next. Um, this is uh, uh, a little, um, um, well, what is it? Crassulaceae, Dimorpha, Elf Orpin, which is a, a plant that we're on the edge of the um, range of this little plant. Talked to, and uh, I did have um, this little um, plant from the grocery store that everybody uh, got a chance to to dissect. So we went through that. Next. Uh, another break. Okay, next. Uh, cactus family. I think a lot of times people are, are, are uh, surprised to find that we have cactus in our, uh, our native flora. Um, so I talked about some of the, um, you know, some of the um, things that that these that our opuntia, our native cactus, has in common with um, some of these other um, ornamental or houseplant um, cacti that we that a lot of us own. Next, and this is really this is really I think this is probably a good place to stop because. Um, I think I don't think I included any of the you're right. We did get to 55, but I don't think I included any of those other slides um, beyond this. But I did want to do just um, a quick uh, nod 
to the grass family and and the other animals that they have plants that look like grasses that remind us of grasses, the graminoids, and so talked briefly about um, the type of flower uh, that grasses have and the bracts that are associated with the flowers, uh, the perigenium, which is a structure that you find in the carex genus, and then the rush flower that looks just like a teeny weeny lily, just a, a beautiful little thing. So just a quick um, nod to those, as I said. Um, so then just jump all the way to the end, the end. And um, this is um, so funny. Did you get the joke? The end. Um, uh, this is um, one of Charlotte's little, she was so ecstatic to be able to, to actually uh, photograph this, this bumblebee headed into her little turtle head. So this, that was, that was my, my program. And, um, and I know we kind of dashed through it, but um, I'm certainly happy to answer questions. All right. Wow, that was a lot. It's a lot to digest. <laughs> well, I think most people already know most of it. I'm hoping right. that it was just kind of a tour through, um, you know, what you already know is kind of fun to review all that stuff. Yeah, it's mostly a review for a lot of folks, I'm sure. Yeah. And it's a good review. It's a good review. Uh, any questions? I don't see any in, oh, it says two new messages. Fantastic presentation. Thank you so much. From Macy Brown and Carol Reese says, thanks. Lori Grabner says, thank you. Thoroughly enjoyed it. Roxanne says, thank you. Well, um, Janet Byers, thank you so much. I wish it was reviewed. It felt like the first time. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I think, uh, you know, really, obviously, I would, um, this is the, I think, a tough topic to do, you know, in just as a lecture, um, because, well, you all are plant people, you know how great it is to actually see these things and get down in there and look at them closely and um uh and our hands dirty and our knees it dirty. really needs it needs the it needs the hands on i think to sort of make it real yes yes um thank you the illustrations were beautiful and valentine and those were mary's illustrations she's quite an artist as well mm -hmm. as a musician um Lots of thanks. Apparently, very well liked. Well, that's so, awfully nice. Well, this is just a nice group. That's that's explains it. <laughs> uh, it's seven thirty or Eastern time when it starts. We were, we, oh, okay. This is going back to the beginning. Ah, uh, <laughs> all right. Well, well, certainly it's good you. to see everybody. I'm so glad. Thank you so much for joining us, Mary. This well, was really for, thanks for having really me. a good review for all of us. Um, and if it's new to you, then maybe you'd like to take the full course. Yeah. Or just Join email Mary me. for a whole <laughs> class. Or get one of the books, then you can take it at your lips. There's so yeah. much to learn about plants. And there's there's such a variety of plants. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. It truly is. Keeps us They're learning. So They're so beautiful. Um, all right. I don't see any actual questions. Lots of good comments, though. They're fantastic. Your books are fantastic, very informative, and beautifully illustrated. Thank you, Mary. Well, thank you. So many of the folks, and I, I second that. Thank you very much, Mary. You are a delightful pinch hitter. <laughs> <laughs> the The rest of the group didn't know, but uh, two weeks ago, I had my my plan speaker 
said, I can't do it in that time frame. And I uh, scrambled and found Mary, and she was willing to pinch it and did a lovely job. And I thank you. And actually, yeah. this is not a bad time of the year for us to be reviewing. True. You know, taking True. A look. In anticipation of spring to come, right around the corner. Yes. That, if we're sitting at home with the snow, <laughs> why not pull out a good botany book and take a look? There you go. And then pull out the catalogs or go online and look at our native plant places and find out what's going to be up for sale. So uh, if anybody has uh, questions, now's the time to propose them. But lots of good comments. All of them positive. Once, oh, Bettina says, I would love to have done the dissections. You can, Bettina, just go to the grocery store and pick up a few of those plants. There you go. <laughs> a lot of them have them. <laughs> true, that's true. It's very, very I can just get a bouquet of flowers mm -hmm. anywhere prefer at the grocery store. Uh, heads up, Kroger has $7 bouquets, and it's a nice variety. <laughs> So, all right, I'm going to put in a plug for next month. Uh, hope everybody can join us to learn all about ferns. We'll go into more detail. And uh, most of you know that Alice Jensen is a dear friend of mine, and she's back in the hospital. If you want to know, hear more about what's going on with Alice, just stick around, and uh, we'll share what we know. Okay. Uh, the rest of you, I'm going to say good night and thank you so, so very much, Mary. Very much appreciated. Thank you, Mary. Mary. Thank you. Thank you. And it was well attended, too. <laughs>